What's good? It's Woog. Canelo Alvarez defeats Jamel Charlo via wide unanimous decision. And I'm talking two scorecards had it 11 to 1. And one scorecard had it 10 rounds to two. And it's hard to argue with those scores. I mean, it became pretty clear pretty early that one, Jermel Charlo's punching power didn't appear to carry to 168, at least not in a way that presented any problems or concerns for Canelo. Uh, Jermel Charlo didn't get Canelo's respect. I thought that um, in order for him to have a chance in this one, he would have to get his respect somewhat early. And he did not do that. And it was also clear that Jermel Charlo did not like the intensity and the ferocity of the shots that were coming at him, especially the ones to the body. Even though it wasn't a body shot that knocked him down to the sixth round, it was a hook that kind of made it through Jermel Charlo's guard. And rather than being nearly dropped, because it wasn't like he was dropped, he took the knee And I looked at that as him basically saying, okay, I got shot. Didn't expect to get hit like that. It was a big flush punch. And then, you know, how Jermel Charlo would kind of dip his head to either hold Canelo or get in a in a headlock, basically put himself in a headlock with Canelo. He was basically doing a lot of dipping to get out of the way of danger from early on in the fight. And in this one, when he dipped, Canelo kind of threw like a little uppercut, caught him dipping down too. And then you saw Jermel Charlo take a step back and then take the knee. So I thought that he was basically, you know, saying to himself, I need to buy myself a few seconds here. And, you know, during the preview, the reason I went via decision and not by stoppage is because I was kind of giving Jermel Charlo the benefit of the doubt in terms of his durability, his heart, and his his boxing skill and ability. Basically thinking, okay, I think that even if he's in trouble or things are not going his way, he will be able to move enough and jab and hold and move again and just do all of the different things to be able to make it the 12 round distance I mean if somebody is determined to survive in a fight and to fight a survivalist fight it's really hard to stop them especially if they are elite or near elite caliber I mean even if you look at Boots Ennis versus uh Karen or Karen in you know two fights ago for Boots I mean Boots is a very gifted fighter who's able to stop a lot of people but if somebody again is committed to moving and committed to not engaging in a way where they're going to be in long sustained combinations and give and give the opponent a chance to get multiple shots off on them at a time yeah they're going to be hard to stop so what did we see I thought that Canelo I thought that his jab was very good you know Jermel Charlo had a nice looking jab as well it just didn't seem it almost looked like he was kind of punching underwater yes he did catch Canelo with some of those hooks some of those counter hooks I thought that was some of the best stuff that he was landing so if Canelo were to open up with a couple punches there were a couple times where Jamel Charlo was able to pull the trigger between Canelo's punches land cleanly but still aside from like maybe one or two punches that looked like they kind of stopped Canelo in his tracks Canelo just didn't respect Jamel Charlo's power and kept on applying that sort of patient pressure cutting the ring off, and then you just saw, you know, Jamel Charlo moving laterally, side to side, let's move this way for a while, throw a punch or a couple punches, move the other way for a while, throw another couple of punches, let's hold. He was doing a lot of things to buy, you know, five seconds here, 10 seconds here, and it resulted in a very lopsided decision win for Canelo. I thought Canelo's punches just looked snappy, man. Like, he, he his punches have such a thud to them. It's like, I think my brother said that he sounded like he got... He had microphones in his gloves and I remember hearing you know some of uh, Tito Trinidad's punches sounding like that like when Tito fought uh, William Joppy that was his last fight before fighting Bernard Hopkins Tito Trinidad's punches just sounded like they it sounded uh, very concussive it sounded like a kick drum or sometimes it sounded quite frankly like a snare drum just a loud cracking shot and Canelo uh, again I mean he wastes very little when it comes to motion, when it comes to punches. I mean, you see, sometimes you'll see him kind of throw a wide scooping hook away that misses, but you look at the the velocity of the punch and you're thinking like, damn, uh, Charlo's lucky that that one didn't land. There were, there were a few of those, but if you're thinking about how Jermel Charlo was going to have success, again, if you are not 
able to hit hard enough to really get Canelo's attention and you're having to move to reduce the amount of punishment you're taking at the hands of Canelo, then it's like, okay, what, are you going to kind of pitter pat your way to a boxing, you know, round over round decision win, like that type of win, it looked pretty clear because of the nature of the fight and how these combinations and, and rounds were taking place that Jermel Charlo wasn't going to be able to do that. So then you're basically reduced to, I've got a puncher's chance and maybe I could catch Canelo with something and hurt him. But then you saw Jermel Charlo land a couple very promising looking punches that didn't have promising looking reactions from Canelo. So then it's like, one of those horror movies or something where, you know, you try to shoot the alien or the enemy or the monster with all kinds of stuff, basically giving it all of your best firepower. You see it doesn't do anything. Then like, you know, you and your buddy or something look at each other. Then it's like, run! I thought that it was kind of like that. Like, uh oh, this didn't work. That didn't work. That didn't work. Oh boy, it's going to be a long night. You better get on your bike and you better start doing what you need to do. I mean, make your, you know, make your mind up. Either you're going to engage and fight a kind of kill or be killed fight where, yes, you are probably going to get stopped and hit a lot more if you stay in there and exchange a lot more, hoping to get more of those punch between Canelo's punches opportunities. You can either go that route or or you can start moving and just picking your spots on when to engage. And that's what Jamel Charlo did. I mean, it would not be prudent of him to have just stood in there and just start exchanging with Canelo moment after moment after moment. I didn't expect him to do that. It wouldn't have been smart for him to do that. The, uh, the best approach would have been if there is something that he could do in between the two options where you are moving laterally, but you are finding more opportunities to back Canelo up with the jab, to throw two, three punches at a time. And you saw, you saw Charlo trying some of these things. Like he did try to throw two to three punches like a one two or even a one two three or even that uppercut he was trying to put different combinations together to see if he could start backing Canelo up like getting him off of him because if you're able to back Canelo up not only are you winning those moments of the fight where okay you won a 20 second clip of that round but you're also able to buy yourself more time through backing them up you could either buy time by moving holding and doing all those other things or you could buy time by letting your hands go and getting Canelo to put up a high guard and to wait it basically wait it out let, let you finish throwing your combination and then maybe Canelo throws one or two counters one to the body or something like that but Charlo, when he would try to step on the gas, yes, again, he would have a couple moments where it's like, oh, a couple punches got through. But again, they just were not doing enough to encourage Jermel Charlo to keep on doing more and more of that. So again, it, it became noticeable or clear through like five or six, definitely through six rounds after the knockdown that Jamel Charlo was going to have to try to, you know, survive this fight, basically stop taking it to Canelo. Well, not that he was taking it to Canelo early in the fight, but there was even a reduced chance that he was going to be taking it to Canelo, you know, and that became clear. And I guess the one remaining hope would have been that Canelo possibly slows down in the second half of the fight like he did against Ryder, Triple G in the trilogy fight, Bivol, and so forth. And then maybe you could step on your gas step on the gas then because Jermel Charlo does tend to carry his punching power, whatever punching power he has for that fight, he's able to carry it late. And he's able to, you know, box effectively, still throw punches, still be durable in the late round. So maybe that was kind of an outside hope. But Canelo didn't really slow down this time. Yes, Jermel Charlo, again, did have some success in some rounds, but it was hard to give him any more than one, maybe two rounds of that fight. So, again, he was kind of reduced to having a puncher's chance. I thought Canelo looked very impressive. Jermel Charlo, I mean, maybe he, okay, we're going to talk about what is in these two guys futures immediate futures for Canelo it looks like it's one of maybe three things David Benavidez which I mean David Benavidez is going to be fighting Demetrius Andre can't wait for that one and can't wait to discuss that one so it doesn't look like that will be the very next fight even though Canelo's next fight is going to take place in May so there would be enough time like if if David Benavidez beats Demetrius Andre, when they fight like near the end of the year, it still gives him five months to 
basically agree to and prepare for a fight in May, if that's going to be the opponent selection. Another one is Terrence Crawford, and that one is starting to get more and more chatter. Just there, there's a curiosity about that one, because I think that the idea is that Terrence Crawford overall is a better fighter than Jermel Charlo. So yes, it is an additional division to have to climb. Terrence Crawford will be coming up three divisions to challenge Canelo at 168. But I do think that there's a bit of an appetite for that fight. Definitely much more of an appetite for that than there is for the rematch at this point between Crawford and Errol Spence. And yes, Crawford did heavily criticize Charlo after this fight. He basically said, uh, you should be ashamed, basically. Like, you essentially saying, you didn't come here to win. You didn't go out there and really give it everything. And if you were of the mindset that or if you were of the belief that Jermel Charlo was going to leave it all in the ring, you would be disappointed with that performance because it looked a little bit like, ah, OK, this isn't working. Let's let's survive. That's what it felt like. I mean, a little uh, like Adrian Broner versus Mikey Garcia, even though I would say Jermel Charlo tried to do more to win that one. It was just moving away a little bit less than Adrian Broner was against Mikey um, and also a little bit like Errol Spence versus Mikey Garcia in a way where no Charlo wasn't controlled in terms of like the real estate in the ring and just being out sweet science he wasn't controlled to the degree that Errol Spence controlled Mikey but it was one of those things where you where it almost looked like there was a satisfaction from Jermel Charlo or maybe relief that the fight was over and that he went the 12 round distance. Again, that could be disappointing depending on what you were expecting Jermel Charlo to do. And yes, you expect him to do more to try to win and to essentially go out on his shield if need be. But he wasn't willing to do all that. But, you know, to his credit, he took a lot of punches from Canelo to the chin, to the body, clean punches too. Jamel Charlo's got a chin and he's durable and he's a very tough guy. So uh, is it going to be Jamel Charlo versus Terrence Crawford, you know, for Jermel, the remaining belts that Charlo has? So if he still has three of the belts because the WBO, I believe at this point, has stripped him and made Tim Zhu the actual champion. If they did that, then OK, he's got three remaining belts. Will Terrence Crawford be interested in fighting Jamel Charlo for those three belts and then moving or pivoting to fight the winner of Tim Zhu and Brian Mendoza, assuming you know that Terrence Crawford beats Jamel Charlo? Would he be interested in that path or does he just want to kind of sit and see if he could get this Canelo fight next? I'd be very curious to see how that plays out. And then I think that there's an outside chance that Canelo and Dimitri Bivol might still be makeable at 168. I don't know what Bivol's plans are. He doesn't have any opponents scheduled. He needs to get back in the ring. He hasn't fought since he beat Zordo Ramirez. And yeah, that's a pretty disappointing 2023 for Dimitri Bivol. So we'll see if he's willing to, you know, capitulate a little bit more in terms of what his ask is financially. I mean, of course, we want to see Bivol Bivol versus Better Beav. Better Beav is about to fight Callum Smith in January. So there's time for Bivol to take on a fight. But again, if it's going to be against Canelo, it'll probably have to be in May. So we'll see how that plays out. I think that Dimitri Bivol was under the impression that since he fought the superstar Canelo and he beat Canelo, that now going forward, he should make something close to Canelo money. And that just isn't that just isn't the reality. That would be like if Ugas, you know, beating Pacquiao thought that going forward, he should be making Pacquiao money. It doesn't always work that way. But again, I was very impressed with Canelo's performance. Yes, he was fighting a smaller fighter coming up two weight classes, and it looked to be the case that it was a stronger bigger fighter who was more accustomed to fighting bigger fighters against a smaller guy who wasn't used to fighting guys uh, that strong, that powerful, that durable, and so forth. So it looked like we were suspicious of it looking or at least those of us who were saying, yeah, this is this is too much to jump up and to be able to be super competitive with Canelo. This was not a very competitive fight. It appears that Canelo's hand is healed. Like when he said, nobody beats this Canelo, what I took that to mean is, well, one, a motivated Canelo, 
I don't know. I'd have to hear it from Canelo's mouth that he really undertrained or something for like John Ryder or for the uh, trilogy fight with Triple G. Maybe he took his foot off the gas when it came to preparation a little bit, but I thought that it had more to do with having a healthy hand. So after the surgery and then after that one fight post-surgery against John Ryder, it looks like Canelo's hand is better and that he feels very good about his future prospects, regardless of who he gets in the ring with. But yeah, personally, I would love to see him fight David Benavidez, but I am intrigued by Canelo versus Terrence Crawford. Like, it sounds pretty crazy, but I mean, if you look at skill for skill and what Crawford brings to the table in terms of his timing, in terms of his punch placement, punch selection, yes, we'll have to see if he is durable enough to handle Canelo kind of walking him down and applying that patient pressure. We'll see how he would handle that, but I wouldn't be mad at that matchup at all, really. Um, I think that I'd rather see that than to see Jamel Charlo versus Terrence Crawford. But, you know, with Jamel Charlo, we'll see how he wants to navigate his career going forward. I don't love the idea of him coming all the way back to 154. I think that maybe you go a little bit down to 160. You know, it's just that, you know, he, he's in his 30s. We all remember, or many of us remember the Roy Jones after you went up to beat John Ruiz, try to come back down in your mid 30s to light heavyweight. And then we saw what that did to him. Not to take anything away from Antonio Tarver. Tarver threw the punch at the right time and Tarver gave Roy Jones hell in their first fight. But the idea is that Roy Jones was never the same after he came down from fighting John Ruiz and winning a share of the heavyweight title. I think that Jermel Charlo would be better served to maybe campaign at 160, which, I mean, it's kind of slim pickings in terms of who your elite uh, opponents would be at 160. I mean, maybe try to get a fight with uh, Chris Eubank or something like that, even though Eubank doesn't have a title. And Jermel Charlo seems to be about legacy more than he's about uh, money. But I don't know, maybe his philosophy on that might uh, be compromised or might change. But I don't see Jermel Charlo uh, like itching to fight like Janabek. Not that he's scared or anything, but just because it's not a um, it's not a, a, an attractive fight to the boxing public. I mean, it, it's not a bad fight, but I just think that he's looking for uh, having big moments and having legacy building, legacy defining moments. And yes, winning a belt at 160 could do that. I mean, maybe he fights Carlos Adamas, uh, who's got you know the lesser share of the WBC belt that his brother, Jamel, br Jamel's brother, Jamal Charlo, still occupies. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how he navigates things going forward. I mean, will he come all the way down to 154 and fight Tim Zhu. I still want to see Jermel Charlo versus Tim Zhu, but again, Tim Zhu is going to be fighting Mendoza. We'll just see how those things work out. But again, I was impressed by Canelo's performance. I was also concerned about Jermel's hand, you know, post surgery, being that this was his first fight since hurting his hand and having it surgically repaired. I wasn't sure that he was going to have uh, a lot of confidence in the durability and the sturdiness of his uh, hand, of the hand that got injured. But I, I'd have to hear from Jermel Charlo whether that played any sort of a, uh, a factor in the fight. I mean, I think Canelo said that he needed that John Ryder fight and that his hand wasn't totally healed at the time of that fight. I think he said something like that. Let me know if you heard the same. But yeah, those things I was think I was considering as factors going into this fight. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think that Jermel Charlo, his body and his power and his abilities didn't scale up at 168 in an ideal way. Maybe a year or two down the road or another couple fights at 168, he could eventually grow into that division if he wants to. I kind of have my doubts now that he's, you know, 33, going to be 34. I, I don't know what kind of success he would have against some of the bigger 168 guys. You know, like you could see his stomach area. He wasn't as tight as he is at 154 or as tight as he would be I'm presuming at 160 he looked like he was carrying a little bit extra you know didn't have the same definition but you know I, I was surprised that he was able to move for 12 rounds in the way that he was able to move and to absorb punches over the course of 12 rounds like he did and you know be able to throw the punches when he was throwing them his timing was still pretty good his power just wasn't as devastating and you know if your chances of beating Canelo rely on you hurting or even stopping Canelo that's just a tough ass 
ask, man. Canelo is one of the most durable fighters I have seen, period. I mean, the guy, again, I keep on saying he went 24 rounds with near prime Triple G without hitting the canvas once, fighting even fights both times. Regardless of who you thought won those fights, Canelo did that. At 160 against Triple G, the guy's got a, a granite chin. Very difficult to hurt. But again, Jermel was pretty damn durable himself, especially in this fight. Let me know what you thought of Canelo versus Charlo. Were you disappointed in uh, in Charlo's approach to the fight and the way that he handled the fight after the first few rounds? Do you think that he was spooked? early by Canelo's power, by his style of pressure. Did you think that that was the same Jermel Charlo? To me, it was kind of, I mean, I had seen a, a, a Charlo who's not throwing enough punches in many, or at least uh, at least three or four of Jermel Charlo's fights. So that wasn't totally out of the ordinary. I mean, the movement was a little bit more than normal. You know, usually you don't see him just circling and moving like, like you really don't want to engage the guy. You don't see a ton of that from Jermel Charlo, but we did in this fight. But yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments, please. And also, who would you like to see Canelo fight next? And if you were to grade Canelo's performance, what grade would you give it? I would give it a an A minus. I would give him an A minus, maybe B plus, but I would say A minus. I thought he was very crisp boxing wise. Um, he, you know, handled the punches that he did take very well. And again, he's very economical. I don't know how that would work out with a David Benavidez who throws a lot of punches and puts a different style of pace on you. I mean, Canelo would have to hurt Benavidez or something like that because I don't see him just totally slowing Benavidez's uh, output down. Benavidez has this kind of snowball avalanche, you know, pick up steam type of approach. Canelo, if anything, seems to... I, I can see him struggling with somebody who's able to put a pace on him. Jermel Charlo was not able to put a pace on Canelo. If anything, it was Jermel Charlo who was put on the proverbial treadmill. You know what I mean? But yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Please like the video. Subscribe to the channel if you are into the fight talk. I'm Woog. Thanks for tuning in.